Welcome back to D20 Tactics. On this channel, I play Dungeons & Dragons with my friends, and we explore the combat scenarios and play all the tactics, use to defeat monsters quickly and safely, giving you more time to get back to roleplaying. I'm your host and Dungeon Master, Saracen Zero, and this week we have a recap of the dungeon recently completed by Azure Wolf, Blind Oracle, Kron, and Fear No Equal. First, I'll replay the six encounters of the Vampire Count's Castle, and we'll talk about the encounters that we thought deserved more commentary. If you've recently watched those encounters, I'll put a timestamp for the start of the discussion in the description below. All of our heroes made it home after this one, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. The adventurers have made their way into a spooky vampire castle. They're going to start at the bottom of the castle and work their way up to the levels, slaying vampires and other undead as they go. Anyone have any spells they want to precast? Precast Simulacrum. I put the Cloak of Protection on the Simulacrum. Water Breathing, Mage Armor on me and the Simulacrum. It's a ritual to get my bird up. Heroes Feast, 1000 GP, do I have that? Yes. The answer is yes. yes. Is everybody gonna split the cost of a Heroes Feast? Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. We love Heroes Feast. Heroes Feast is going to give the party immunity to poison and frightening, and all wisdom saving throws will be at advantage. It also increases their hit point maximum by 2d10. It's going to be 17, and they gain the same number of hit points. What level are you gonna cast aid at? I think I will have to defer to the party here. Should I be upcasting here? I feel like we have upcast this in the past. Third level at this point, or four, whatever you feel like you need to. Cast aid at third level then. So that'll be a total of plus 10 to everyone. Doesn't it only target three? You got one target who doesn't get it. I'll just not cast it on myself. That'll be fine. Cracking the big 200. That's absurd. Hit points, ability spells, items in hand. 118 hit points at a 118. A wand of magic pestle and a wand of lightning bolt. Four first level, three second, three third, three fourth, two fifth, one sixth. I have used up my seventh for my simulacrum and one eighth level spell. Arcane recovery is not used up. The fighter has 206 of 206 HP. We have a great axe plus two in hand. We have both of our indomitables as well as our action surge and second wind available to us. And we got our wing of boots on. I'm playing the cleric who has 155 out of 155 HP. Both of my channel divinities, four level one spells, three level two spells, two level three spells, three level four spells, two level five spells, one level seven spell, and one level eight spell. In hand, I have a war hammer and a plus two shield. The rogue currently has 150 out of 150 hit points. Holding my plus two short bow in hand, using plus one arrows, with the instrument of the bards slung over my back. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter is the first encounter of the dungeon, so by tradition it is the big scary monster encounter. This big scary monster is a mummy lord. Mummy lords have a couple of things going on. They have a 17 natural armor, fairly tough. Double digit hit points, so actually not that tough. They're fairly slow with a speed of 20. They are vulnerable to fire, but they are immune to necrotic poison, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non-magical attacks, which is basically none of yours. They're immune to charm, exhaustion, frighten, poison, paralysis. They have a passive perception of 14. Rogue is going to be out of their range in all the cases. They have magic resistance to spells and magical effects. They can spell cast. They can multi-attack. This mummy has legendary actions. They can attack throw blinding dust, throw blasphemous words, channel negative energy, or create a whirlwind of sand. So the legendary actions can be done after player turns. Any questions about the mummy? I assume that it's blatantly obvious that it's undead. Blatantly. The terrain is fairly straightforward. Tunnels, hallways, and passageways. You guys have snuck your way into the castle. Tactics. What do you guys think for tactics in this fight? Don't lose the simulacrum, because we probably don't need to lose it for this fight. And the mummy's going to want to take down the simulacrum, because he always wants to take down the simulacrum. I feel like we need to burn this pretty quick. The, the legendary actions are going to be obnoxious, and the fewer of those we have to get through, the better. Yeah. I'll probably just try to hit him with the biggest spell possible right out the gate. Probably burn action surge and see if I can just throw two turns worth of damage at him, too. Since this is an undead enemy and I don't know what we're going to be encountering for the rest of the dungeon, it seems like a good as time as any to throw out a quick channel divinity. This is a vampire castle, so you kind of know what you're going to be facing. So perhaps not then. <laughs> also, we love those channel divinities for health recovery. So if that's what we got, let's go ahead and roll initiative. The most important roll. Anybody have higher than a 20? Anyone have between a 15 and a 20? I have a 15. It's upside down day. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? 11 on the fighter. Rogue has a 10. Anyone have between a 10 and a 5? 7 on the wizard. Five on the mummy. Owl is a three. Cleric, you're up first. Kick us off. All right, I'll start us off with a guiding bolt then. That's 21 total. 
21 total. That'll hit. Total of 18 damage. After that is the mummy's legendary action. The mummy is going to use Whirlwind of Sand. This takes two of its actions. It magically transforms into a Whirlwind of Sand, moving 60 feet, and then reverting to normal form. Oh, we're having this fight in the doorway. We're having this fight in the hallway. Well, that's exciting. Bunker this, you filthy casual. <laughs> After that, we're going to go to the fighter. Yeah, we're going to move north of the Mummy Lord. Does it take difficult terrain to move through the owl space? No. Hey, let me get on the far side of the Mummy then. Start swinging. Great axe attack. This has advantage. So that's a total of 25 to hit. 25 hits. 19 damage. And this is magical, yes. It is. Attack number two. 17 to hit. 17 hits. For 14 damage, attack number three. That's 24 to hit for 19 damage. Action surge. 17 to hit again. 17 hits. 17 damage. That's an 18 to hit. 18 hits. 15 damage. And final attack. Nope. No? The mummy is dead. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, okay then. Fighter said, I got this. For what it's worth, I missed on the last attack. Well, of course you did. He fell over. I feel like the burst down was a good call. Report hit points, Cleric. I have 155 out of 155 hit points. 206 out of 206. 150 out of 150. 118 out of 118. I deeply apologize to anyone who watched the entire start of this video for that to be the entire combat. <laughs> That's what it's like the banish. I was sure it wasn't a bundle of sticks and toilet paper. The mummy is dead. The first encounter is done. Not a lot of difficulty in these big scary monster encounters, so onward and upward through the rest of the castle. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. I'm playing the cleric. I still have 155 out of 155 hit points. I have both of my channel divinities. I have three level one spell slots, three level two spell slots, two level three spell slots, three level four spell slots, two level five spell slots, one level seven spell slot, and one level eight spell slot. I have a Warhammer and a plus two shield in hand. Fair new equal, as the fighter has 206 of 206 HP, we have our Great Axe plus two in hand, and we have two Indomitables and one Second Wind available. Action Surge has been used to great effect. We also have Winged Boots on our feet. 150 out of 150 HP, holding a plus two shortbow using plus one arrows, instrument of the bard slung across my back. 118 out of 118. I have all seven charges on both the magic missile wand and the wand of lightning bolt. Wand of war mage in the hand. Four first level slots, three second level slots, three third level slots, three fourth level slots, two fifth level slots, one sixth level slot, and one eighth level slot. And arcane recovery is still available. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has a single vampire deviant, which is like a regular vampire, but you know, different, and three flame skulls. Vampires have a couple of abilities. They have a shape changer ability. As we've found in the past, most shape changer abilities are garbage. This one is especially garbage. Here's a note that I want to read to you. The vampire can use its action to polymorph into a tiny bat or a medium cloud of mist or back into its true form. Again, this is an action. While in mist form, the vampire can't take any actions. So if you turn into mist, you can't turn back. They have a legendary resistance, which hopefully I'll be smart enough to use this time. They regenerate 20 hit points as long as they are not in sunlight or in running water. Water, or if they took radiant damage or damage from holy water. They can spider climb up ceilings and walls without making checks, though they do not have a climb speed. They do take 20 radiant damage when they start their turn in sunlight, and they have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. That might be relevant. They have multi-attack for their unarmed strike and their bite. They can charm as an action. They can summon children of the night as a once per day ability. They also have legendary actions to move, unarmed strike, or bite people. This encounter also has three flame skulls. Flame skulls can cast spells like magic missile, flaming sphere, or fireball, as one might expect. They also have a fire ray that can fall back on. They have magic resistance and resistance to lightning, necrotic, piercing, immunity to cold, fire, and poison, as well as charm, frightened, paralysis, poisoned, and prone. Passive perception of 12, making them out of the range of a sneaking rogue. And the vampire has passive perception of 17, active perception with a maximum of 27. Potentially, they could spot you. Okay, so we are ruling for that. Until that one dies, at least. Any questions about the vampire? Specifically, sunlight, correct? They don't have vulnerability to just any kind of light. 
Correct. They're resistant to necrotic and non-magical weapon attacks, but they do not have vulnerability to specifically radiant damage. The terrain and effects. You are in an indoor space. These bars can be opened like doors. They are not currently locked. You can pass through them using an object interaction to do so. Same thing with the doors back here. That's what the terrain looks like. Door is currently closed. Everyone is aware of everyone else. Tactics. What are the thoughts about tactics in this? Well, I do have two spell scrolls of protection from energy. That seems like a potential good cast because of three sources of fireball in the vicinity. Yeah, do we have some way to produce radiant damage? Because I don't think we have... Yes. I have several ways. I have five holy waters and just general spell casting that produces radiant. I can literally make a sunbeam. Do we want to go after the skulls first or the vampire first? Because if we go after the skulls, the vampire doesn't regenerate until we start putting damage on it. Is this one of those we want to use the globe or no? That is a good idea, I think, yeah. I think that's a great use of that tool right now. Globe of invulnerability on the vamp to keep it from doing anything. That does sound like a good idea. No, it's cast on us. Oh, sorry. It'll take care of that fireball. Yeah, the action economy tells me that we do want to take down the skulls first since they're likely to have a lower HP. Makes plenty of sense to me. Do it right here or go out in the room a little bit. It's going to come down to initiative, really, I think, for that part. Yeah. In that case, let's roll some initiative. Anybody have higher than a 20? 21 on the wizard. 20 on the vampire. Anyone have between a 20 and a 15? Anyone have between a 15 and a 10? 11 on the cleric. 10 on the rogue. Anyone have between a 10 and a 5? 7 on the fighter. What do you got for me, Al? 3. Need your wolf, you're up first. Step into the room with three spaces and cast Globe of Invulnerability. Any spell, fifth level or lower cast from outside the barrier can't affect creatures or objects within it by command for the simulacrum. Call dodge. At the end of your turn, the vampire is going to take a legendary action. The vampire can move up to its speed. Now it's the simulacrum's turn. So he's going to call dodge. Then the vampire is going to use another legendary action. Now it's the vampire's turn. Vampire's going to walk into here. Vampire's going to do an unarmed strike against you. 17 to hit. Put a pop shield because it's worth it. Then we're going to do a second attack. Same target. 16. That's probably not going to make it. No. That's my vampire. Three of these guys. They're going to sit where they're at. They're each going to ready a fire ray as a ranged spell attack to throw at you. So they're going to concentrate on that. They're going to attack one of you when you get into a position that can hit you. After that, we're going to go to the Kron. I'll go ahead and move up into melee range with the vampire above the wizard. Make a swing with my Warhammer. It's going to be a total of 25 to hit. Hits. It's a total of four damage. Now that's nine total radiant damage. Four is gonna be cut in half because it resists non-magical weapon attacks. So that'll be 11 total. That will prevent it from regenerating at the start of its next turn. After the Kron, we're gonna to go to the Vampire. We're gonna unarmed strike again. 21 to hit you, wizard. After that, we're gonna to go to the Blind Oracle. Bonus action stealth, half to roll. I get a 25. Sounds good. South one, shoot with the short bow into the vampire. The old standard play pattern does a 27 hit. 27 hits. Seven sneak dice. Okay, party time. You should have eight sneak dice. Eight sneak dice, thank you. I'm sure that extra d6 will save it. It was a really weak roll and into another weak roll, so 37 points of damage. And this is magical piercing, so it's going to take all 37 of it. Yep. And then we are going to move back. After the blind oracle, we're going to throw another vampire attack. Vampire's going to go after the wizard again. 25 to hit you, wizard. That's a hit. Instead of dealing damage, the vampire can grapple the target with an escape DC of 18. So that's what it's going to do. After the blind oracle's the fear. Move out to the east side of the wizard. And we're just going to start wailing on this vampire. Attack number one. So that's a 27 to hit for 17 damage. Attack number two. That's a... 25 to hit for reroll. 15 damage. Attack number 3. 25 to hit for 14 damage. And that will do for us. At the end of your turn, the vampire is going to move. Does that provoke an attack of opportunity? The legendary action specifically says the vampire moves up to its speed without provoking an opportunity attack. Flame skulls can hit. It's going to be the wizard they're going to shoot. Beautiful. I got a 7, a 9, and a 9, all of which will miss. After the fear, we're going to go to the owl. Move them in. Advantage for the rogue. And then back behind the cleric? Yep. After the owl, I'm out of legendary action, so it's then going to be the Azure Wolf. We're going to burn through three charges. On the Wanda Magic Missile? Yes. That is a four on the dice. 
4 plus 1 is 5, plus 5 is 10, times 5 is 50. That's exactly how many hit points the vampire has left. It turns to mist and disappears. Moving back in the globe. <laughs> What's the instruction for the simulacrum? He's going to move into the globe and dodge again. Right behind me, please. After the Azure Wolf is the vampire, vampire allies, they're going to all cast spells and ready actions. Nobody wants to counter spells, so the spell they're going to ready is magic missile to shoot at whoever comes out of the globe first. After that, we're going to go to the Kron. Sacred Flame. So DC 18. DC 18. They have magic resistance against this. 14 plus 3 is not going to do it. Hits. Total of 13. Concentration save for the West guy. He will pass with a 18. After the Kron is the Blind Oracle. These are hard corners, correct? Yes. Can't end in the cleric space, correct? Correct. Cannot end in the cleric space. You can end in the owl space. All right, so go ahead and move me into the owls. Bonus action hide. We're going to shoot at the skull on the far side. Well, there's the crit. Oh, boy. One moment, please. Now I have a Warhammer's worth of d6. 18 d6. Less impressive than you'd think. I mean, the number, the, the final number is less impressive. 69 points of damage. They do have damage resistance to piercing. He takes 38 points of damage. Does it need to make a con save for the magic missile? Oh, it does. This is going to be a DC 19. Fails, so this guy loses his spell. Fear, you're up. Probably fine without me going out there and triggering them, so I'm just going to stay here and dodge. After that, we're going to go to the owl. He's going to dodge. After the owl is the Azure Wolf. Azure Wolf is actually going to step out there for a very specific reason. <laughs> Just right outside the globe. That's where I want to go. Magic missile goes off. Yep. A shield of Brooch <laughs> just negates it. <laughs> <laughs> Brooch is shielding coming in clutch for the first time ever. <laughs> While I'm here, let's magic missile him. <laughs> one charge expended. That's a one on the die on the one on the far left, please. One plus one is two. Two plus five is seven. Seven times three is 21. This guy's going to take 21 points of damage. And move back in. That was hilarious. After that, we're going to go to the simulacrum. What do you order the simulacrum to do? He's going to step out and he's going to expend a second level spell slot to try to kill that one on the far left. Guys, is three, please. Three plus one is four. Four plus five is nine. Nine times four is 36. It drops. One square back? Yep. After the Age Wolf is the Vampire and Vampire Allies. They don't have much they can do. This one's going to cast a spell. Simulacrum will hit the one on the right with Counterspell. Guy in the middle cell is going to cast a spell. You're going to Counterspell it? Yep, both of them. That's me, and then we're going to go to the Kron. I have it, so I want to use it. I'm going to go ahead and use my bag of tricks, move 25 feet to the closest one, and then I'm going to throw a jackal appears, order it to attack. That is a definite miss. That is a six total. Well, that was fun. That was the Kron blind oracle. Bonus action hide. We're going to try and shoot the easternmost one again. 20 to hit. 20 will hit. Perfect for 30 points of damage. 30 is reduced to 15 as it resists piercing damage, and 15 is lethal. After the blind oracles, the fear no equal. Advance directly towards it, and then dodge. After the fear no equal is the owl. I'm gonna move him in, give advantage for the rogue. Yeah, the door is closed, and the owl doesn't have the hands to open it. Yeah, the reason that the jackal was able to get in there is because it was a little ball of fur before it appeared. Just dodge. Just dodge, okay. Age wolf. More magic missiles. Two more charges. He's going to throw up a shield and take no damage from that. Burn up his reaction. The simulacrum. Dodge. The Azure Wolf is the vampire's allies. He's going to throw a fireball in a place that hits all of you guys. So let's counter that. Who's doing that? Simulacrum. No reason to proc an opportunity attack, although we can hide behind the jackals. Give us a little bit of cover. After that is the Kron. I'm going to move the jackal out of the way. Uh, the jackal's going to go ahead and attack. <laughs> no, my cover. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like it noted. Any other animal on that list would have been better. That's a seven on the die this time. The jackal misses. So I'm just going to go ahead and Sacred Flame. Magic resistance. He's going to fail with a 15. Slightly better than the jackal. That's going to be seven damage total. And then I'm going to move to left corner. So I'm out of his sight. After the Kron is the blind oracle. Bonus action hide. Stealth check says 20. 25 minute. Can I see it from there? No, I actually have to move behind the simulacrum to see him. Let's move to behind the simulacrum and then we'll take the shot from there. 26 to hit. 26 hits. God, math is hard tonight. 47 points of damage. 47 is reduced to 23 after the resistance. I would like to go one west. After the blind door calls the fear. Advance and open the door and then into the cell and attack. That's a 19 to hit. Yep, hits. 12 damage. 12 points is lethal. Skull drops to the ground dead. Hit points remaining. 
So mine is 118. He has 46. I have 155 out of 155. 150 out of 150. 206 out of 206. This is the first short rest. Anyone want to take any pre-rest actions? I wish to sprinkle holy water on all of the skulls so they stay destroyed. Sounds good. I would just like it noted that that jackal is just here now. Anyone have anything <laughs> they want to do after? I'm going to throw back a potion of frost giant strength. It's going to upgrade my strength to 23. Give me an extra plus one to hit on things and plus one damage. The first vampire has been slain. The adventurers are going to backtrack to the coffins they found before, stake this one in its coffin, and then move on to the next encounter in this dungeon. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. Age Wolf has 118 hit points still remaining. He has one charge left on the Wanda Magic Missile, so that one's out for the rest of the encounter. Full charges on the Lightning Bolt. Arcane recovery is still up. Three first level slots remaining. Three second, two third, three fourth, two fifth, and one eight. The simulacrum has still got 46 out of 46 HP, and he has four first, two second, one third, three fourth, two fifth, one sixth, and one eighth. The cleric has 155 out of 155 HP remaining. I have a plus two shield and a warhammer in hand. I still have both of my child divinities. For spell slots, I have three first, three second, 2 3rd, 2 4th, 2 5th, 1 7th, and 1 8th remaining, and I have 2 out of 3 uses of my tan bag of tricks remaining. 150 out of 150 HP remaining, plus 2 short bow in hand, plus 1 arrows in the quiver, instrument of the bards slung over my back. 206 out of 206 HP remaining, we have a frost giant strength potion in use that gives us 23 strength, we have great axe plus 2 in hand, and we have action surge, second wind, in both uses of Indomitable remaining. I do have to ask you to update the map with a jackal. Jackal's just hanging out, having a good old time, doing jackal stuff. <laughs> Till he hits zero. Sort of like the simulacrum, honestly. That skull was weird, but he don't mind. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has two mages and one archmage. The two mages have a couple of abilities. They are ninth level spell casters. They can cast up to fifth level spells. There's a variety of them. And they also have daggers, which they're never going to use. The mages have pre-cast mage armor, as one might expect from a character of that name. The archmage is an 18th level spell caster. They can cast up to 9th level spells. They also have a dagger that they're not going to use, but they have magic resistance to go along with it. The archmage has pre-cast mage armor, giving it 15 AC. It has pre-cast stone skin, giving it resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. It has pre-cast mind blank, any effect that would read its emotions or thoughts, do its psychic damage, or charm it, are not going to work. The terrain is pretty straightforward. You guys are in a corridor. The doors are closed. Tactics. What do you guys think for tactics in this fight? We really want to shut that Archmage down if we can. Is he not on the other side of the doors uh, right now? Yes, currently. I can't think of any spells that would be particularly dangerous unless those doors open. So we might be able to take down the mages and ready some shenanigans before we open the doors. Well, he could open the doors, too. That is also fair. More likely, I would say one of those mages will open the doors. Yeah. So the He's tactics here might simply hinge on the initiative order. I would love a haste if it's available. Yeah, I could do that. We could use Globe again. Still have a six level slot on him. So we want to try to negate some of that. I don't know if it's going to be all too helpful here or... It doesn't sound bad, but I don't know if we want to burn another level six slot this early. We still have two more encounters, right? It's coming off the simulacrum, right? Yep. So it's already burned in a sense. There's no reason not to spend it. Basically have him try to burn as much as he can with the big guy back there. If he stays alive. Yeah, because the little guys can't do anything about the globe at all. They can't can't cast above its level, but the big guy is going to go straight through it. Do we want to put it here or out in the room like I did before? It, again, depends on the initiative order, I think. Just a minor thing is I'm probably going to start with casting Bless because it helps with saving for us. So just to recap, we're planning on trying to burn the big guy as fast as possible or pick the little guys off. What was the call there? If we get enough of us ahead of the mages in the initiative order, I'd say we try to take down the two little guys. But if they get a little bit forward, then we burn down the big guy. Yeah. yeah. Roger. Let's go ahead and roll some initiative then. Anybody up higher than a 20? Fighter has 20. Anybody have between a 20 and a 15? Two 15s. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? Rogue has a 13. Who's got between a 10 and a 5? Cleric has a 9. I have a 7. I think we got the jump, guys. Fear, you're up first. Let's open the door, move six paces to the east, and start beating on nerds. Rude. This is what you get for spending your life with your nose in a book. Somebody breaks into your house and hits you with an axe. <laughs> that one's a hard miss. We're gonna try this again. Hey, this one's a crit. 24 damage. Attack number three. 
Ooh, that's another hard miss. You know what? Let's just go for it. Yeah, we're gonna action search. A 23 to hit for 12 damage. That's a 26 to hit for 11 points of damage. Lethal. Yeah, there we go. I do have one more attack, but I'm out of movement. And I used my object. Unless you want to throw your axe at the guy. Swing wildly. After the fear, we're going to go to the wizard. He's going to move to east. I'm going to take a shot with a level 4 tragic missile slot at that one. No, we're going to hit you with a shield. Shield works. To west, please, for the simulacrum. Please move owl four spaces. Cast the globe. After the Azure Wolf, we're going to go to the owl. And he's going to move in and get vanished through the rogue. Eight to there, you got four back. You want into the globe? Yes, please. After the owl, we go to the rogue. Let's go ahead and move into the globe, and then we'll go ahead and shoot our wizard friend up north there at advantage. 29 to hit. 29 will hit. For 42 points of damage. 42 is lethal. Move up behind the simulacrum. Hide bonus action. 26 to hide. That is my turn. After the rogue, we're going to go to the cleric. Doors are shut. If I use my full move to get to the doors, I'm not going to be able to ready an action. Correct. You'd have to dash to get there. I'll go ahead and move to the edge of the sphere of vulnerability uh, on the east side. My jackal has a movement of 40, so I'll just move him as close to the doors as I can with just the movement. And then I will go ahead and cast Guardian of Faith at the doors. It will hover at the doors and attempt to deal a 20 radiant damage to anything that moves to a space within 10 feet of the Guardian for the first time on a turn. Must succeed on a dexterity saving throw. Are you good there? Yeah. The mages. Well, the mage. Mage is going to cast Time Stop. <laughs> when you said there's nothing he can do without line of sight, I was just like, ninth level spell is Time Stop. All he's going to do is Time Stop. I do not have any experience with high-level D&D play. It's always time stop. You briefly <laughs> stop the flow of time for everyone but yourself. No time passes for other creatures while you take 1d4 plus 1 turns in a row. I rolled a 1, plus 1 is 2. I can make 2 additional turns. I have to get through that door. I can move through this thing, right? You can move through it, but it's not a creature. Oh, I have magic resistance. What's the DC on the Guardian of Faith? Uh, 18. Archmage is going to get a 21 to avoid that, so it's going to take 10 points of damage. Guardian for the first time on a turn. Time stop says you take 1d4 plus 1 turns in a row. I'm going to have to do this again. So the Archmage is going to cast Time Stop as an action, walk to there, open the doors as a object interaction, no bonus action this turn. Then it's going to take its first Time Stop turn. It's going to take another dexterity save for the Spectral Guardian. It's going to get a 22 on this one, so it'll take another 10 points of damage. We're going to throw Banishment on the Fighter. Fighter, give me a DC 19 Charisma save. 22. 22. That will succeed. No bonus action for me. I'm going to move. That does end your time stop, though. Yep, screwed that up. Well, that was entirely wrong, and now I have to die for it. To the mage, we're going to go to the fear. Fear, you're up. Move into close quarters with the archmage and explain to him why he's a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> First attack. Ooh, I should stop calling them nerds. I roll really badly when I do that. Second attack. That's 24 to hit for 16 damage. Third attack. 18 to hit. 18 hits. For 16 damage. And that's it for me. After the fear, we're going to go to the Age Wolf. I'm going to step into the room just north of the simulacrum. Pull out the wand of lightning bolt. It's going to be a DC 15 deck save. Let's go three charges. Let's over channel it. Why not? Max that thing out. Fails the save. That was 10 dice, so that's 60 plus 5. 65 points of damage, the Archmage drops. There we go. Let's get rid of it. Report hit points. 206 out of 206 hit points. 118 out of 118. 150 out of 150. 155 out of 155. Does anyone have any actions they wish to perform at the end of the encounter? Apologize to the fighter for not hasting them. <laughs> it's fine. I was wasting a lot of those attacks anyway. The adventurers are going to continue on through the castle, slaying everything that they see in their path and taking no damage in return. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. 206 of 206 hit points. We still have Indomitable, two uses. Second wind, action surge has been spent. And we have our Great Axe plus two of Nerd Smacking in hand. Azure Wolf has 118 out of 118 on his hit points. He's used up uh, all but one charge on his magic missile wand. Four slots remaining on Wand of Lightning Bolt. Dark in recovery still. Three first level, three second, two third, two fourth, two fifth, and one eighth level slot. The Rogue has 150 out of 150 hit points, holding a plus two short bow at hand, using plus one arrows, with an instrument of the bard slung over my back. 
Cleric has 155 out of 155 hit points remaining. He has a plus two shield and a warhammer in hand. For spell slots, three first level spells, three second, two third, one fourth, two fifth, one seventh, one eighth. I have both of my channel divinities remaining, two out of the three charges of my bag of tricks, and a jackal. And they called him the jackal. If I were a jackal, be that e tut, be that e daddy daddy daddy. I did not have Fiddler on the Roof on my bingo card for D&D tonight. Look, man, it's been a long-ass week. <laughs> no argument. <laughs> Desperately searching for an owl pun for Fiddler on the Roof. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has a vampire necromancer. Vampire necromancer is like a regular vampire, except he hangs out with a bunch of undead. I guess the other one did too, but anyway. Vampire necromancer has six friends. Three of them are minotaur skeletons. Three of them are ogre zombies. Ogre zombies are immune to poison and have 85 hit points and undead fortitude. If you hit a zombie and knock it down to zero hit points, it makes a constitution save with a difficulty of five plus the damage taken. If it succeeds, it stands up with one hit point. If it fails, it is actually dead. This ability doesn't work if the damage that it took was radiant or from a critical hit. Minotaur skeletons can charge. They do some extra damage when they do so. They have a great axe and a gore attack immune to poison. They are, however, vulnerable to bludgeoning damage. Less of a bag of hit points, a little more AC, but still basically just a CR2. I would say meat bag, but it's actually specifically not having any meat, but you know what I mean. The vampire has a whole mess of abilities. They have legendary resistances. They can regenerate for 20 hit points unless they took radiant damage, damage from holy water. They can splatter climb up surfaces without making an ability check. They can do unarmed strikes. They can charm, they can bite, and they can summon children of the night, which can be a number of bats. I think that's their best option. They also have legendary actions, which allow them to move unarmed strike or bite. Terrain, I think as you guys would expect at this point, terrain is fairly straightforward. There's some terrain. Don't move diagonally through the pillars. The barrels are difficult terrain also. That's the terrain layer. Tactics, any thoughts about tactics in this fight? We've got three encounters left and three eighth level spell slots. <laughs> so I feel like maybe we want to use that sunburst. Let's keep going. Roll initiative. Anybody up higher than a 20? Anybody got between a 20 and a 15? I have a 18. Anyone have between a 15 and a 10? 13 on the wizard. Rogue has 10. Anyone have between a 10 and a 5? I have a 7 on the vampires. 7 on the fighter. 5 for Duke Allington. Kron, you're up first. Wizard, do you have shape spell? Yes, a sculpt spell, but yes. I'll go ahead and cast Dispel Good and Evil. That is a self-cast, and that gives all of the undead disadvantage on attacking me. That's a concentration up to one minute. Simply move forward into the hallway, and then the jackal will move further into the room, getting close to that first ogre. And that'll be my turn. After the crawl is the Asia Wolf. Asia Wolf is going to move up to the corner there, just so he can kind of see around. I think it's just AoE central, because I want to sunburst with this simulacrum. So let's go fireball. Do you want to hit literally every enemy on this map? Yes, please. Right in front of the center minotaur. It'll hit everybody. DC 18 is level 4. I'm going to over channel it again. So I need to take 2d12 damage. That's going to be 12 for me. Sorry, I ended our no damage run. Fourth level fireball is going to be 9d6. Over channeled is max damage. So 9d6 would be 54 plus 5 for your evoker ability is 59 or 29 if they pass. DC 18 deck save. Southeast ogre. Oh man, you were so close. You got a 17. So he's going to take 50. 59. Northern Ogre fails. He gets a 13. But the Western Minotaur fails with a 3. Northern Minotaur fails with an 8. And the Southeastern Minotaur fails with a 4. Vampire's gonna get a 16. At the end of your turn, the Vampire's gonna use a legendary action. He's gonna move there. Simulacrum, please come use Sunburst. Simulacrum's gonna go to here? Yep. Brilliant light flashes from a 60 foot radius. Point you choose in range. Each creature must make a constitution saving throw on an A failed save. The creature takes 12d6 radiant damage and is blinded for one minute. Undead and oozes have disadvantage. Is the simulacrum allowed to overchannel? Yes, he can. Probably worth doing it. Let's overchannel. So 12d6. 72. Does he plus 5? Yeah, he plus 5. 77 or 38. It's a 60 foot radius. If you drop it on the back wall, it stops right before it hits the cleric. I uh, can sculpt because of invocation. The jackal's gonna save and take no damage. Farthest western ogre. He's gonna get a 15. He's gonna take 77. The southern ogre is gonna get a five and drop. Eastern ogre is gonna get a 16 and drop. Southernmost 
Minotaur is going to get a 3 and drop. The northernmost Minotaur is going to get a 4 and drop. And the remaining Minotaur is going to get a 5 and drop. Vampire's going to get a 7. The Vampire's going to use a Legendary Resistance to succeed on the saving throw. Good call. So he's going to take 38. That was 4 to there, so he's going to move 2 back. At the end of that action, the Vampire's going to use its Legendary Action to move forward after the Asia Wolf is the Blind Oracle. Fighter hasn't acted yet, right? We're going to haste the fighter. It's an action. Then we're going to go share a space with the owl and take the hide bonus action. And that is a 25 to hide. After that, the vampire is going to attack the wizard. 26 to hit you, wizard. Yes, that's a hit. It's going to grapple you instead of doing damage. After the blind oracle, we go to the vampire's turn. The vampire is going to charm the fighter. Kindly give me a DC 17 wisdom saving throw against a charm effect. Plus three to our wisdom saves, and we've got advantage. That's going to be a 19. Ogre. Zombie's going to walk forward and stumble into a jackal. It's going to try to hit the jackal. Ogre zombie's going to get a 22 disadvantage because it's blinded at the moment. I'm going to give 14 points of bludgeoning damage. The jackal is paced. No! Continue to shuffle forward. The ogre's going to make a constitution save at the end of its turn. It's going to fail with a 5. After that, we're going to go to the fighter. Let's move north of the vampire, please. And we're going to start by attacking him. That's a crit. That's going to hit him for 27 damage. Second attack. Opposite of a crit. Third attack. That's a 20 to hit. Hits. For 11 damage. Haste attack. 29 to hit for 18 damage. Lethal. Step up into that gap then. And that'll be it for me, because I don't have action surge. Oh. After the fighters, the owl. Gonna give the rogue some advantage and move back. After the owl, we're gonna go to the craw on top of the order. I'm just gonna go ahead and swing with my warhammer. Advantage, because it can't see you. It's a total of 20. Okay, that will hit. Divine Strike goes into effect. That's a total of 9 damage. This guy drops. Some of that is radiant damage, so he can't fortitude back. Report hit points. Cleric has 155 out of 155 hit points. 106 out of 118. 150 out of 150. 206 out of 206. Any pre-rest actions? I was going to ask our wizard if he wants to spend hit dice or just have me cast level 1 cure wounds. I'll hit die. Is this the last short rest? This is the final short rest, that's right. If you're going to spend hit dice, now is the time to do it. I used three dice and recovered 12 hit points. Anyone have any post-rest actions they wish to take? Calculating arcane recovery and pearl of power. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and use my pearl of power as well. Recovering a third level spell? I recover a fourth level and a first level slot. Since the pearl's done, can we tune to those boots again just in case cold damage comes up? Yep, absolutely. Finishing off another vampire, the vampire turns to mist, and the adventurers will track it back to its lair and and stake the vampire in its coffin, removing it from this earth. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. The cleric has 155 out of 155 hit points. I have a warhammer and a plus two shield in hand. I have both of my channel divinities, two out of the three slots on my tan bag of tricks, three first, three second, three third, one fourth, one fifth, one seventh, and one eighth. 118 out of 118 hit points remaining. Four slots on Wand of Lightning Bolt. Four. First level. Second level, I have three. Third level, I have three. Fourth level, I have three. Fifth level, I have two. And one eighth level spell Arcane Recovery has been used up. Holding plus two shortbow, using plus one arrows. Instrument of the Bard slung across my back. 150 out of 150 hit points. 206 out of 206 hit points with a great axe plus two in hand. I have second wind still available, action surge available, and two indomitables still available. And my winged boots. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter is pretty straightforward. There are seven vampire spawn. You've made your way up to the upper levels of the castle. The decadent and aristocratic vampires lounge about here. They look at you hungrily as soon as you show up, and they're gonna try to eat as many of you as possible. Vampire spawn have multi-attack. They can attack with a bite or a claw. Also have the ability to regenerate. They resist necrotic and non-magical weapon attacks. They can climb up the walls, including upside down and on ceilings. Passive perception is 13, no problem for the road. Terrain and effects. Terrain's fairly straightforward, as most terrain in a humanoid structure is. A couple of pieces of impassable terrain, a couple of pillars, can't move diagonally through the pillars. So that's what the terrain looks like. So what do you guys think for tactics in this fight? We were talking about spending our 8th level spells. Do we want to spend mine or the wizard's other 8th level spell at this encounter? Because mine is Holy Aura. 
or I could just upcast Spirit Guardians at level 8. <laughs> that would be gross. Holy Aura is probably at its best here because there's so many enemies. Yeah, and they're spread out too. You could still hit them all with Sunburst. Nothing's more than 120 feet apart. Holy Aura is probably at its best here, so... Just for the record, the Spirit Guardians thing would be 8d8 radiant damage. And it would carry you through the next fight, right? Yeah, it would. As long as you can maintain <laughs> concentration, yes. Do it. Yeah, probably <laughs> worth it. We have taken less damage in this dungeon than probably any dungeon at this point ever, and we haven't yet used Spirit Guardians. Maybe Spirit Guardians is hurting us more than it helps us. Hang on, hang on. Correlation is <laughs> not causation. Does not compute. All right, any other thoughts about tactics? Fighter, you want haste? I would love it. I think this is one where I haste you and just let you go. Let's go ahead and roll some initiative. Anybody have higher than a 20? Anyone have between a 20 and a 15? Rogue is a 19. I have a 17. You've been rocking the initiative. Anyone have between a 15 and a 10? 13 for the wizard. I have a 12 on the vampires. Alistair Crowley's got a 11. What do you got for me, fighter? Nine. Blind Oracle, you're up first. I know we said the wizard was going to haste the fighter, but I'm not doing anything with these scrolls, and my concentration is less valuable than yours. So, bam! Scroll of haste on the fighter. Fighter drops into a sprinting start. Anything else? Bonus action hype. You will not be hidden from the cleric, which I think is a thing you want to not be doing. That is correct. After that, we go to the Krom. Spirit Guardians, 8th level. Cool, tell me about it. Any creature that enters the area for the first time or starts its turn there must make a wisdom saving throw. On a fail save, the creature takes 8d8 radiant damage. On a successful save, the creature takes half as much damage. Because you have your eyes closed, all of them are... I'm just kidding. You got anything else? Uh, since the fighter dropped into a sprinting start, I'm going to leapfrog over him and then go around the corner to the nearest vampire. After the Kron, we're going to go to the Age Wolf. I'll move up, get to where I can shoot him with a magic missile. Level 5. 4 on the die. 4 on the die plus 1 is 5. Plus 5 is 10. What's the level? 5th. So 7. You're going to do 70 points of damage to this mook. Pretty much. I want to get rid of him. Cleric. I'm going to go hit this guy with Spirit Guardians. Wizard. No, you're not. Not if I get there first. I have decided no. For the simulacrum, cannot get up there, so let's move him behind the fighter and dodge. After the Azure Wolf, we go to the vampires. Homeboy starts to turn off in the zone. Tell me about it. DC 18. Thank you. He's going to fail with an 8. So 48. God, that's a lot of damage. He's going to take 48 points of damage and drop. Wow. This one's going to start to turn off in the zone. Give me some damage. 28. She's going to fail with a 7. Then she's going to move to there, kick over the chair, stand on top of it, and bash you with a cup. That's exciting. Or try to. It's very exciting. It's the most animated vampire enemy we've had in a while. Right? 22 to hit you. That misses. Yeah, somehow that misses. Cool, so she's <laughs> going to do it again. 23 to hit you. That misses. I don't see any other way out of this, so the only way out is through. <laughs> I am a tanky half point. This one's going to dash into the zone. Give me some damage. 39. She fails with a 5 and takes all of it. She's going to dash to there and give me some damage. 43. She's going to fail with a 13. This one's going to go... She's going to dash to there. Give me some damage. 36. She's going to fail with a 2. If you can't dash in there, then there's no point in moving. So he's going to dash to there. He's going to dash to there. That's all my guys. After the vampires, we're going to go to the owl. So that one just east of me, please get advantage for the rope. After the owl is the fear. I want to go east of the southeast vampire spawn. I am going to provoke... She'll take it. 10 to hit you. AC is 20. First, I'm going to use my haste attack on this guy. That's a crit. I mean, I gave you the character. I can't complain. 18 damage. That did not kill it, so I'm not going to be able to move into its spot. That's fine. First regular attack, same guy. 17 to hit. 17 hits. For 11 damage. Second attack. Ooh, that's a 1. Trying third attack. Oh, and that's another 17 to hit. 17 hits. 12 damage. 12 is lethal. You have movement left. Do you want to move into a spot? I do, and I'm going to move in. You know what? We're going to do the thing. Action surge. Green guy to the west of me. Oh, that's a two to hit. Miss. That's a 23 to hit. 23 hits. 15 damage. And that's a 17 to hit for 16 damage. That's it for me. After the fear, we're going to go to the blind oracle. So we're going to move. You have advantage to hit this one. Can I see that one from there? I don't think so. It would have three quarters cover. I'll take that shot. Okay, plus five AC. Yeah, I'll take that. 23 to hit. Hits. That's what we like to call big damage. 46 points of damage. 46 is lethal. You got a bonus action? I do. Let's go ahead and leapfrog over the simulacrum and then take bonus action hide. After the blind oracle is the cron. I'm going to go ahead and swing at the green one right below me. Total of 19 to hit. 19 will hit. Total of 23 damage. How much damage did you do with the Warhammer? 4 plus 2, I think. It's going to take all 17 of the Radiant. It's going to resist the mundane Warhammer damage. Only take 3 of that. It'll take 20 points of damage. I'm just going to hold my position and end my turn there. After that, 
we're gonna go to the Age Wolf. We're gonna fourth level magic missile, but I'm going to split the shot. I'm going to send four to the blue guy and two to the green guy. I'm over channeling. My damage is nine damage. Five, three, and a one. Max die on the die is four. Four plus one is five. Five plus evoker five is 10. 10 times four missiles on this one is gonna be 40 points of damage. 10 times two missiles on the southern one is gonna be 20 points of damage. It's gonna drop. Move to the right for the rogue, so let's do that. Appreciated. Yep. After the Azure Wolf, we got the other half of the Azure Wolf. Let's step up and he's gonna do the third level magic missile blue guy please that is a three three on the die plus one is four plus five evoker is nine times five is 45 this one's going to take 45 points of damage and drop what else move him north one please after the azure wolf is the vampires vampires are going to regenerate they haven't taken any damage nor have they taken any radiant so nothing happened there they're going to try to bash this cleric to break the concentration. Cleric, give me some damage. 37 on the first vampire. He gets a 19 for his wisdom save, so he's going to succeed, and he's going to throw down against you. 11 to hit you. That misses. 13 to hit you. That also misses. Second guy is going to do the same thing. Give me some damage. 34. He's going to fail with a 9. He's going to throw two attacks against you. I'm going to get a 9 and a 10. Those both miss. After the vampires, we go to the owl. Move him in and blue guy, give advantage please to the rogue. After the owl, we go to the fear. Move me east of the guy in the blue cape, and we're going to make our first attack on him. 18 to hit. 18 hits. For 11 damage. Second attack. 17 to hit. 17 hits. That one's for 19 damage. Attack number 3. Uh, 16 to hit. 16 hits. 15 damage. Attack number four. That's a one. That's not going to do it then. After the fear is the blind oracle. Move north one and attack the blue guy that I have advantage against. He's got cover, but I don't think you care. Not particularly. Is it 28 hit? Hits. Respectable. For 40 points of damage. Drops. We're going to pop back one and hide. After the blind oracle, we go to the cron. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and swing at the remaining vampire. 20 total. Hits. Warhammer's going to do 6 damage. So the 6 is going to go to 3. And that's going to be 12 radiant damage. He's going to take 15 points of damage. After the Kron is the Age Wolf. Fourth level magic missile. Over channel it again. And ow. There's you some damage. 43 damage. 43 damage to you. Whoa. Look at this guy taking damage. 6 magic missiles. Maximum on the die is 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. 5 plus 5 evoker is 10. 10 times 6 is 60. He's going to take 60 points of damage and drop. And that's the end of the encounter. Let's report hit points. 150 out of 150 HP. 155 out of 155 HP. 66. 206 out of 206. Any end of encounter actions? I'd like to channel my divinity to heal the wizard. Can't. Wizard's over half HP. Channel divinity can only bring somebody back up to at most half their hit points. In that case, I should probably cast a spell instead. I also have Potion of Greater Healing. I assume that it's better to use the spell slots that regenerate rather than the consumables. No, uh, burn the consumables. And then I'll just hand over a Potion of Greater Healing. 44 plus 4. And that is 14. With the fawning sycophant vampire spawns turned to dust, the adventurers are going to head up the stairs into the room of the vampire lord running this place and probably whoop some vampire lord, but we'll see what happens when they get there. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. Plus two short bow in hand, plus one arrows in the quiver, instrument of the bard slung over my back. I have 155 on 155 HP. I have a plus two shield and a warhammer in hand. For spell slots, I have three first, three second, three third, one fourth, one fifth, one seventh. And for my channel divinity, I have both still. And I have two out of three slots on my 10 bag of tricks. I've got 80 hit points out of 118. Four first level slots, three second level slots, three third, a fourth, a fifth, and an eight. Arcane recovery is used up. 206 out of 206 HP. I have both uses of Indomitable and Second Wind still available. I have a Great Axe plus two in hand and my winged boots. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has a vampire lord who's running the vampire castle. Well, what's left of it? They've killed pretty much everybody else. He is accompanied by four whites. They have multi-attack with two long swords or two long bow attacks. They can also life drain, which does a bit of necrotic damage. They can reduce hit points by the amount of damage dealt. They resist necrotic and non-magical, non-silvered weapon damage. 
the vampire is the same vampire you know and love non-magical weapon resistance necrotic resistance passive perception of 17 so rogue you're gonna have to make some rolls they have three legendary resistances per day they can regenerate they have an unarmed strike and a bite attack they can charm people they also have three legendary actions per the start of their turn which they can use to move without provoking opportunity attacks they can unarmed strike or they can bite those are my vampires terrain terrain is pretty closed in you're in an office coming up the stairs from the room you were just in tactics what do you guys think for tactics in this fight moving forward and hitting dodge <laughs> do you want to upcast sunbeam for sunlight damage that's consistent or just sunburst i think taking those whites off the table would be nice although i guess the spirit guardians is also kind of going to do that but the sooner we can take them away the less likely they are to knock off the cleric's concentration runs up contemplating whether or not i should throw some more animals at people but that's more just for me the wizard never has to contemplate that he throws animals at people all the time sounds good let's go and roll some initiative anybody have higher than a 20 anyone have between a 20 and a 15 17 for the rogue anyone have between a 15 and a 10 i have a 10 on the vampires who's got between a 10 and a 5 eat wizard six on the fighter I have a five. And I need an owl. Weird owl has a three. Took me five encounters, but I finally did it. I beat most of you. Now is my time to shine. Blind Oracle, you're up. Yeah. Hmm. Snipe the guy from downtown. Bring this whole thing crashing to the ground. Sure. Bonus action hide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like the nonchalance. I'm like, yeah, might as well. 25? 25 will do it. Let's go ahead and shoot the white just in front of us. Does a 28 hit. 28 will connect you. Yeah. For 41 points of damage. I'll just hang here. <laughs> At the end of your turn, the vampire's going to use a legendary action. He's going to move up to there. Then it's the vampire's turn. The vampire's going to try to charm the fighter. Fighter, please give me a DC 17 wisdom save versus charm. We got a plus three here, but we do have advantage. It's going to be a 22. 22 will do it. Then the vampire's going to move over here. The whites are going to switch to their longbows and open fire at the cleric. 17 and 11 to hit you. Those both miss. AC is 24. Next guy's going to fire. He's going to get a 17 and a 14 and then move to there. This guy's going to move over to here, take two shots. 19 and an 11 to hit you. Both miss. 18 and a 15 to hit you. After the vampire goes the Asia Wolf. Toss me. Sunburst because I don't need to actually move because it's a point I choose. You have to be able to see the target, I imagine. DC 18 con save. Undead have disadvantage. If they fail, they blind. Over channel it. So 12d6. 12d6 is going to go 72 plus 5 is 77. You're going to do some damage to yourself. Five dice now. That's a 40. Vampire's going to get a 22 to save. So he's going to take 38. Southernmost white is going to get an 8. He's going to take 77 points of damage and drop. The white just above that is going to get a 13. He's going to take 77 points of damage and drop. Eastern remaining white is going to get a 5. He's going to take 77 points of damage and drop. And then the remaining white is going to get an 8. He's going to take 77 points of damage and drop. The end of your turn. I'm going to use my legendary action to move to there. That was the Asia Wolf. Now the second half of the Asia Wolf term, the Simulacrum. Move forward and Magic Missile at fifth level. Ice number is three. Three plus one is four. Four plus five for an Evoker is nine. Fifth level Magic Missile is going to be seven missiles times seven is 63. After that, I'm going to use a legendary action to move back. After the Azure Wolf is the Fear. I'm just going to head straight to the Vampire through my allies. Dashing to get there. I mean, I'm dashing all the time, but... At the end of your turn, we're going to try to hit you. Vampire gets a 20 to hit you. That'll hit. It's going to grapple you. After the fear is the cron. I will have to follow fear not equal and dash as far as I can get. After the cron, we're going to go to the owl. Let's just move him right north of the cleric. After the owl, we're going to go to the blind oracle. Dash, take the shot into the vamp. A halfling luck kicks in. For a crit. <laughs> 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 no. Every time you've grappled. <laughs> it has literally been every time you grappled. It's true. <laughs> you were just saying something about correlation and causation earlier. I was actually, so that's on me. 78 points of damage. 78 points of damage, vampire drops. And that's the end of the encounter, and that's the end of the dungeon. You guys loot your way through the castle, taking everything that's not nailed down, and only until the rogue gets there with his pry bar to peel it off for you.
you find 42,000 gold worth of treasure that comes out to a split of 10,500 gold pieces each. You find four magic items, which are a mantle of spell resistance, a ring of free action, a spell scroll of holy aura, and a spell scroll of dominate monster. I don't know the reason that the cleric would need access to two holy auras terrifying if true well you could cast it twice but its duration is up to one minute it also allows you to use holy aura and eighth level spirit guardians in the same dungeon that's true that is true vampires are defeated the castle is clear of undead maybe the adventurers take this as their base maybe they think that you know scrubs used to live here and so we need something more high class something more impressive they move their way on to somewhere else the next dungeon is a demonic cult uprising and you'll have to fight a set of six encounters all based on that theme and stop the demonic cult from doing demonic culty things you know like they always do but we'll see what happens with that next time i know it's gonna be difficult but it is the tradition what was the easiest encounter <laughs> it has to go to the first despite the fact that the room full of vampires was hilarious it's gotta be the first i didn't even have to do anything this one i cast guiding bolt and i didn't need to i don't actually know if we would have gotten the kill without the guiding bolt because i did need all six of my attacks and you crit on some of them not on this one i think well, i'm pretty sure you crit on that i thought you opened up with a crit but was there anything that i could have done to make this harder does mummy lord have lair actions because that felt like the missing piece of me it was not impressive enough for a party of 15s i was wondering maybe if it had lair actions or something there's interesting things you could do that are not in base D and D. I don't think that's what you're going for. Yes, it turns out mummy lords do have lair actions. However, a mummy lord encountered in its lair has a challenge rating of 16, so it wouldn't have been appropriate for the current setup. This is also not a mummy's lair, so it wouldn't have been appropriate for this encounter. However, lair actions go at initiative count 20, so it probably would have gotten one of them off. Each undead creature in the lair can pinpoint the location of each living creature with 120 feet. Each undead in the lair has advantage on saving throws. Until initiative count 20, any non-undead that tries to cast a spell is racked with pain. They make a DC 16 constitution save. If they fail, they take 1d6 necrotic damage per level of the spell. I don't think that the lair actions would have made any difference. Yeah. My spell was cast at the top of the round. Unless you started the combat with that, then... It would have had an effect. More than just this encounter, it seems like we've been presented with a lot of rooms through which we can access all of the enemies at once with a big AoE spell. In this particular combat, that didn't have an effect. Disposition of the party seemed to very much be burn down the biggest, scariest thing as fast as possible. In a room with only one mummy lord in it, strategy was fairly straightforward. That causes combat to have the potential to swing either way very quickly, and that happened multiple times this evening. So, for example, your strategy of teleporting the mummy lord behind the party was a very effective strategy. If he hadn't immediately burned his action surge on literally the first round of combat in the encounter, that had the potential to go very differently very quickly. It just never did. So it's hard to say what you could have done that wouldn't have immediately thrown the balance completely out of whack. I could have consumed a couple more resources, right? So the Mummy Lord can cast Harm, which is probably their opening move to just blast you guys with Harm. Yeah. But it only drops you down to one hit point, so you still would have survived it. Then as a legendary action, it can do Blasphemous Word, but that only does non-undead within 10 feet, so it doesn't do anything. Channel negative energy. It's within 60 feet. You can't regain hit points, which doesn't actually do anything. Whirlwind of Sand is the one that I wanted to do in this case. Could he have strung together more than one legendary action before anybody else had the opportunity? No, they get one legendary action in between turns. How long does that prevention of healing last? End of the Mummy Lord's next turn. When you had the opportunity to do damage to the party, a lot of the times you chose not to. And then by the time it cut back around to the vampire, the vampire was dead. The same thing kind of happened to the Mummy Lord here, where you chose to reposition the Mummy Lord to a position of extreme advantage, but by the time he could have capitalized on that, he was already dead. But I didn't actually have the chance to do any other. So my legendary actions are attack, either with Rotting Fist, can't because I'm not within range, or Dreadful Glare. Dreadful Glare doesn't actually do any damage. It could potentially frighten or paralyze somebody, so arguably that would have been the good one. Can't frighten. It could have potentially paralyzed you, but it's a DC 16, everybody's got advantage on their wisdom saves. So unlikely for that to be effective. I thought you listed harm as one of the possibilities for legendary action. Harm is one of their action actions, not one of their legendary actions. Blinding Dust. So if you hadn't been killed immediately upon getting behind us, Blinding Dust would have been the move that might have helped you last. Because the problem with the Mummy Lord is he's got low AC and he's got low HP. <laughs> you can't do that against a 15th level party and not just get nuked. 
the only solution that he has is to reduce our ability to hit him, and Blinding Dust is like the only thing that does that, but he'd have to live long enough for that to happen, and it just isn't the case. I don't even see Blinding Dust being effective. It's a DC 16 constitution save. Better than Dreadful Glare. What is the awareness ability of his in his lair actions? Each undead creature in the lair can pinpoint the location of each living creature within 120 feet of it until initiative count 20 on the next round. If this was less of a big room and more of a small room at the end of a long twisted hallway situation, you could have made that so that the party was within 120 feet long before they had eyes on the mummy lord at which point we may have for example strung out the party with some dash actions at which point you may have simply teleported mummy to the nearest target given what the turn order would have been saving that legendary action until the turn was closer to his own to morgan so fear you think you were within attack range of him i was not in fact i know that i wasn't i needed to dash to get to him at his initial position him moving out of the room was probably the error he wants us to come to him and get in range for blinding sand because at the same time he's got guardian of faith that he could have slapped on that door and tagged everybody who walked through it and he's got silence which he could drop on the door and keep our mages from staying outside and peep and shooting him force them to come into him he shouldn't have to come to us if he can force us to come to him he chose to move within our fighters attack range before he had the opportunity to defend himself he chose to move right before the fighter's turn. If he had chosen to move after the fighter, that would have probably gone a lot differently. Because then I would have been on the other end of the combat. I would have gotten some damage down, maybe. But then he would have just said, nope, I'm out of here. I don't like close combat. I'll go sit next to this, the simulacrum. At that point, he could have teleported in front of the rogue and potentially dropped him. But I assume he can't do 150 damage in a turn. The rogue is super tanky at this point. He's got harm, though. Something as simple as him having a couple of adds, like, say, snakes or something like that, and then him casting harm and the snakes dealing the remaining damage. But that's a different encounter. Like, that's a comp- that's re-engineering the encounter at that point. Him not moving until after the fighter did is the biggest improvement that could have been made. Keep awareness of the initiative order. And I try to do that with, especially charm abilities, but uh, keep awareness of who's going to go next. It feels really bad for the fighter, but like you run all the way over there on your turn and then it's like, cool, I'm going to teleport back to where you just were. And you're like, all right, now I got to run all the way back. Honestly, I would have loved if that happened. That's a very dramatic dun-dun moment. Mummy Lord is a mummy lord. He's intended to be used with some mooks that he can add some bonuses to. Not an option here, but in an encounter construction perspective, really, really best used with some mooks. But that is not the premise. Sometimes you're going to fight single target monsters. This dungeon felt easier because a lot of the stuff we were fighting had low hit points and required setup to do damage, which is a thing that we are particularly good at dealing with because, oh, the monster is now set up to do damage to the insert potential victim here kill that one first the immediate focus fire and the big spells and it just it felt like you needed more turns than we were ever going to give you and that was kind of the theme with this entire dungeon with an evoker and a rogue and a simulacrum there's just so much burst then that last encounter you had kind of hit upon something that i think would have been more to your advantage had you pushed it a little further which was the vampire choosing to move around the corner to where we all didn't have line of sight with him and had to move to him to deal damage much more difficult question what was the hardest encounter it would have to be that last one i would say the whites weren't particularly difficult they fold to a eight level spell just like most other things do vampire never had a chance is this the only enemy that hit an attack a couple of them landed grapples so the thing about the grapple is they do 1d8 plus 4 bludgeoning damage on an unarmed strike if they grapple you they can throw a bite attack which will do 4d6 plus 4 damage your maximum hit points is reduced by the amount the vampire gains hit points equal to that amount. I was trying to get the bite off, but I can only do the bite if you're already grappled. And you can't grapple us as a legendary action. No, I can't. I unarmed strike you as a legendary action. I can't charm you as a legendary action. So all of my action actions were to throw charm at people to, to try to even out the numbers. If you had successfully charmed the fighter earlier on while he was hasted, that would have been a very different encounter. Just drop haste like we did before. That drop haste stun... I always forget about dropping haste. There were definitely three different times that I got hit with spells, and I saved all three times. Most of those could have been linchpin moments in some way. I appreciate that, like, last time we went deep into charm and the tactics of charm, you went hard on the elf and 
the cleric, and this time you went for the fighter, and I still beat it every time, but I shouldn't have beat it every time. I rolled way above my batting average on those saves, and I intentionally have committed two of my attunement slots into improving my saves, without which I would still have missed at least one of those. I think that that was still the right target for the charm. I just shouldn't have beaten it three times out of three. Balancing an encounter for a party of this level is incredibly difficult. Because I'm a high-level cleric, I also have access to greater restoration. If that had ever occurred, I have spirit guardians up. I would have simply cast greater restoration to cure the charm immediately. You can take an action and just punch them. Oh, you can punch to cure charm? No, it depends on the nature of the charm. So the vampire targets a humanoid can see within 30 feet. If the target can see the vampire, the target must make a DC 17 wisdom saving throw against this magic or be charmed by the vampire. Target regards the vampire as a trusted friend to be heeded and protected. Although the target isn't under the vampire's control, it takes the vampire's request or actions in the most favorable way it can. And it is a willing target for the vampire's bit attack, misspelling a bite. Each time the vampire or the vampire's companions do anything to harmful for the target, it can repeat the saving throw, ending the effect on itself on a success. Otherwise, the effect lasts for 24 hours or until the vampire is destroyed, is on a different plane of existence, or takes a bonus action to end the effect. Different from succubus. Pretty much every type of charm is different. And then there's the fundamental underlying condition called charmed. You could kind of argue it. I would probably interpret it as they're going to give you instructions and then you're going to follow them out. In this case, it would usually be to grapple some and then pull them as far away as possible because I don't want to deal with them. So that takes two people out of the equation. Probably the cleric. Who would at that point touch the fighter and cure the charm. You're going to want to look at something like protection from evil and good. I think that will suppress a charm, although that is a concentration ability, so you would lose spirit guardians. Still not the end of the world. Takes a couple of actions away from you guys, which is kind of what it should be. It should be to take a couple of actions, not put a potion down permanently. Honestly, just being able to get the grapple off and burning the fifth level spell slot for greater restoration. I, I don't know if you need to go that far to burn the rest on that right because the rogue also has protection from evil good on the instrument of the bards it's not just a suppress it also allows an immediate reroll. one of the big elephants in the room for these entire encounters is just the presence of a stock out of box life cleric in a room full of vampires if these encounters had gotten more long-winded with rejuvenation there's layers that the cleric shuts down just by being there Fighter also does a lot of burst damage as well. I think Rogue and Fighter are about on par. I think Rogue can burst a little more consistently. I have one burst per two fights. So the Rogue's going to do... 8d6. 8d6 plus 1 is 9. What's your damage modifier? Plus 10. You're going to drop about 41 points of damage if you hit with full sneak dice. The fighter is going to throw 3d12 plus... What's your damage modifier? 7 to 8. So 21 plus... 13 plus another, we'll call it six, is 40. So you guys are tied, assuming you hit. Right, but I have to hit three times, he has to hit once. Right, but that doesn't actually change the expected value. It does a little bit because he can consistently get advantage. I mean, that's probably the only way in which it alters the equation. Advantage for him applies to all of his damage, whereas it, most advantage sources from you apply to only one of them, such as an owl or a guiding bolt. However, there are other sources of advantage that apply in every single case, and there's also sources of advantage that would apply to a melee attack, but to cause disadvantage to a range attack. So it very much depends on the circumstance. He is slightly more accurate at plus 13 rather than your plus 12. The big elephant of the room, though, is the 18, 19, 20 crits. That's going to tip the scales, I think, in the fighter's favor. Not a single crit tonight was a 19 or 20. All of them were 18s. Okay. Without that feature, I would not have crit once. But if without that feature, you would have done less damage and then gotten more attacks. I rolled a 19 for saves, but I never actually rolled a 19 or 20 to hit. It was all on the 18, so having that was a big advantage to my damage output. Asia Wolf, you agree this is the most difficult, or was there another one that you thought was harder? No, yeah, I think this was probably it. So this is the mummy. We talked about this already. This should have been a bait some people in. I just don't know about the bait, though, man, because... Paying more attention to the turn order would have probably made this a lot more interesting. I think we beat this dead horse pretty good. It needs to be resurrected and redone it. As for difficult, Archmage could have been worse than it ended up being. If they would have all gone first. The more rocket taggy this gets, the more that's true. Second encounter, a highly effective globe of invulnerability. Yep. I was looking at this going, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just fireball you guys, and then you're going to have to run around the rest of the dungeon at half health because Cleric's going to pick you up from there. And Glover and Vulnerability just really shut that down. So I guess as long as you go before the bad guys, 
and you have that low-level spellcasters at least are off the table. If the wizard hadn't been able to put down a globe of invulnerability in a spot that gave us line of sight to all the enemies, that would have probably been a lot more of an issue. Um, the enemies have to have a way to attack you. Let's say she runs back and you guys can't see her. Then you're like, okay, we'll just hang out here. You're kind of at a standoff that neither one of you wants to approach the other because you're going to get attacked. I've always played these encounters as if the enemies have to attack you, that they can't just try to run away and not do damage. We talked about this before, but the lack of any other objective. Yes, you can say that you have to move into the room to come get the enemies, but the enemies, unless they have ranged attacks, have to come to you as well. Without perhaps overly complicating this into something past a basic D&D encounter, I can't think of other ways that this would improve. It would be pretty easy to have a simple thing of like, we'll get to her before she destroys any evidence. Then you would have to kill her within like three rounds or something, outside the, the scope of what we're looking at here. You could have moved two of those jail cells to the section of wall closer to the door, and then we would have had to move into that hallway and then we would be taking fireballs from both sides without having a good line of sight. I do a little bit of terrain modification, but for the most part, I'm going to leave the maps alone. <laughs> Didn't know these were pretty fab. You honor me to suggest that I would create this myself, but no, they are all created by the wonderful, lovely and talented Seafood Games. I am also well aware that you hire artists. Kron does the art for the beautiful faces that you see at the bottom of the screen right now. The magic of editing. Woohoo. Like if I had a great use of Brutes of Shielding. Brutes of Shield, I think, for the first time ever came up in this. Yep. So they have Shield and Magic Missile as well. Why didn't you counter any of the Shields? Because I think it was for the reaction for the, the bigger spell, I think is what it was. My goof-ups were in this one because I didn't realize that I could shoot through the bars at the time. I was looking at them as like solid walls type thing. The Jackal was the worst animal I could have rolled coming out of that bag. He did fine. How do you think it does for action economy? Because one of the things that you guys have to contend with is like, yeah, we burst the monster down in two rounds. Well, it means both of your actions have to be really efficient. And you guys have access to a lot of magic items at this point. I feel like the action economy confines those and balances those so that really I can give you anything you want, but you can't use them unless they really are worth the action. Did you think that the animal was worth it or no? This particular use case for it was very, very niche because you had a set of bars that I could throw the animal through. You socially engineered me to think that I couldn't get into those rooms. <laughs> and then the fighter simply walked up and opened the door. <laughs> I don't think I did that. I'll take credit. The optimal action at that point was to just sit in the globe of invulnerability and I wasn't particularly interested in spending the entire combat optimally throwing sacred flames out from safety. Probably the optimal play for me would have been to use Ray of Frost because it's a 60 footer versus the magic missiles to probably beat around that shield. I know they're immune to cold damage. That's pretty much that's it. Yeah, I had nothing. Third encounter was an arc mage, which I've been looking forward to. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm looking forward to using the arch mage. Ninth level spells. I rolled the worst time stop I could, which is two rounds, and then I messed up half of them. <laughs> what you would have alternatively done because this probably had the potential to be the worst encounter it was particularly obvious for this one the initiative order was very key yes yeah, so you guys murked the two other guys i can't get through a globe of invulnerability i'll have to do something that doesn't bother with that i'm gonna banish the fighter globe of invulnerability just prevents spells that they themselves are lower than sixth level so i couldn't even upcast a banishment in correct what i was thinking at the time was i could have upcast cone of cold and gotten everybody but that also would not have worked so the archmage doesn't even have an offensive ability beyond fifth level they have glow and its overlooked status is so good highly effective because there's so few spells being thrown globe is weak in that regard obviously not in every case it was highly effective here it was highly effective in the last one when you are facing a lot of spellcasters it takes the spellcasters off the board for a little bit to give you some breathing room more of a mixed bag for what we were encountering i won't say tip the scales but i don't know that it would have i think you guys just would have dispatched them even faster saracen i want you to give yourself some clemency here the archmages are bad monsters i agree i found that mages on their own is not a very good monster it's a fantastic support monster 
archmages, I imagine, of that, but for higher levels. The problem is is you're running out of budget when you get that high up, right? Because the archmage is CR 14? Archmage is CR 12. You're kind of in this weird place where they become supports in CR 18, 19 encounters, but that's also where you're playing Mega Rocket Tag. The spell list they bring is never going to swing a fight one way or another because the spell list they've got has no offensive output limited debuffing their one shot their hey this is incredible spell is time stop and time stop time stop has been relentlessly nerfed the last three editions to the point where using it to manipulate a fight or create damage or do things is really hard without the right spell list like time stop into wall of force into teleport ends a fight and says the adventurers are done calling a draw i'm going this way you're going that way or time stop into wall of fire and then when you phase back in something like bigby's hand to force push something into the wall of fire that's great but it still requires you to have a bespoke spell list and just grabbing the monster out of the book with the stock spell list is never going to make time stop work. Yeah, they have a wall of force and teleport. They could absolutely just say, oh, I don't want to be here for this, but that's not the format of this. I listed out a bunch of things that I was thinking of using in the order I was thinking of using them and then immediately didn't do them properly. <laughs> so globe of invulnerability should have been cast, although that's concentration, so maybe not. Mirror image, I believe is non-concentration, should have just thrown that as my first one. Hopefully saved me a bunch of damage. And then the rest of them... Yeah, they kind of don't really matter. Their major offensive spell is Cone of Cold. Their backup is Lightning Bolt, which I'm not a fan of, but it has its purposes. Magic Missile is the old fallback. Like, Cone of Cold, because it can't be upcast to overcome a globe of vulnerability, doesn't matter. That was the spell that I wanted to have used. So yeah, I like Time Stop as a ninth level spell. I mean, I wouldn't want to cast it as a character, but I think as a monster, because you're only going to get one shot at this, Time Stop absolutely makes sense, because it kind of lets them shine as like, let me get three or four spells off, makes them look like a good, actually effective monster. <laughs> as you guys found, they probably aren't. Does Global Vulnerability stop spell-like abilities? Spell-like abilities aren't a thing. Spell-like ability is no longer a keyword, like it was in 3rd edition. It depends on the ability. So there's something like the Flame Skull, as well as a Fire Ray which is called a ranged spell attack, so it would stop that. Something like Dragon's Breath was the ability that kind of has the effect of a spell, like it throws fire all over the place. It wouldn't stop something like that. A charm, for instance, is not a spell. Charm person is a spell. The charm of, for instance, the vampires. It resembles a spell, but it is in fact not a spell and would not be affected by Globe of Invulnerability. Yeah, honestly, Globe of Invulnerability was so effective this session that I'm just trying to think of ways around it at this point. Does Dispel Magic dispel it? Nope, it specifically says that because it's a low-level spell, you can't upcast it. Dispel is a three. Any spell of fifth level or lower cast from outside the barrier can't affect creatures or objects within it. I'm not affecting a creature or object within it. I'm affecting globe of invulnerability. Yeah, so I could absolutely dispel magic on the globe of invulnerability. You would have to upcast it if you didn't want to test or just make the test a DC 16. So does the Archmage have dispel magic? Nope. Mm, that <laughs> seems like an oversight. The mages have counterspell. Not at a high enough level to guarantee the counterspell on global vulnerability. Yeah, there was somebody who has dispel magic in this fight, but, uh, or maybe not. I, don't, I thought that somebody did. I guess there aren't any other casters, so I guess I'm just wrong. Perhaps the necromancer? The necromancers are just vampires. Moving on to number four. I'm hesitant to bring in mobs of hit points, like big bag of hit points monsters. Usually they just stand there and they swing at you and they miss, and then you swing at them and you chunk a little damage off. And then that goes back and forth for a couple of turns. And if you have a bunch of them, it's not very fun. But in this case, you burst five of the six of them down in two actions, fireball and a sunburst, doing the wizard simulacrum thing. It's me putting as much AoE downtown. Is that less of a problem now that you can just throw a whole bunch of AoE? So I will say that bags of hit points are okay in my mind, as long as their principal activity is limiting the movement of the party, which is why I wanted to bring up the jackal in particular in this situation where the large monster had to move past the small monster in order to attack us. The jackal acted as a subtraction from the enemy's action economy. And so there are situations in which if the hallway is narrow enough or the monster is large enough, you can use the bag of tricks to essentially throw up a animal-shaped wall in front of your enemy. There's six bags of hit points in this. It takes one of their actions to remove your 
animal. You spend an action to summon the animal, right? I do spend an action to summon the animal. So is that really worth it for the action economy? It's, it's something that I chose not to do at the end of each of these combats. Okay, so that would be the way to use it properly is to... Would you summon all three of them at the beginning? or I would have summoned one because you need to use your bonus action to... Command it, got it. So the other ones couldn't be doing anything. Yeah, so if, if for example, every two combats I summoned one... That would have been useful. As part of the precast actions, you summon an animal, roll it up, and then as soon as it dies at the end of that combat, you, you summon another one. Got it. So I very suboptimally used the Mega Tricks this time. That's probably the use case, I would say, to run interference. To use it optimally, you would probably just cast it between encounters. Actions don't exist in a vacuum, right? We talk about them like they do, but they don't. Blocking a charge lane is more valuable than not. You're talking about the action economy and saying, oh, is it really worth it for Kron to summon a speed bump when I'm just going to run over it and then punch you in the face again? Consider for a minute that blocking a charge lane, Kron spends his action to put the speed bump out. You spend your action to clear said speed bump. If you don't have the next action inherently, that means that someone who needs to get in there or a better speed bump, the cleric or the fighter, now become the speed bump and it's more complicated. It's not quite fair to equate it on a one-to-one -one action for like damage or casting when you put a speed bump out because it's really going to depend on the room and the how and the why that you use a speed bump. In a scenario like this where you've got two charge lanes, you've got monsters that need to charge and all we have to do is buy time for the simulacrum to go off, I think throwing the speed bump out was the right call. If this was a big open field and they could just play DM Curveball and there was no such thing as a speed bumpable charge lane, putting the speed bump out in this case would, would matter as much. So I, I think it's wholly dependent and it's not fair to reduce that to a one-to-one -one action. I understand how the action economy works. You traded one for one. So like if this was the mummy fight and you're like, okay, I'm going to throw a jackal and it's going to consume the entire mummy's action, it would absolutely be worth it. I'm not saying it wouldn't. I'm saying in this case, all you did was you bought one of the bag of hit points. Now at that point, there was only one bag of hit points left. Maybe it was worth it in that case. Calling a thing a speed bump is only a benefit if you're considering the resource that you're using to do it. Absorbing the enemy's actions is always a good tactic. If you do that and you only stop one person from fighting, but the other five people on their team get to do a thing, I don't know that it's necessarily true. As to this charging lane, because they're large creatures, unless I'm in a button hook, run forward, hit it, run back. Although at that point I wasn't going to because there was nobody blocking it. That would be the right way to counter that blocking of the charge lane is you'd have to run in, kill it, and then run back, opening that lane up for somebody else. I completely agree. The bag of tricks performed far above its weight class, let's say, illustrated best by the previous encounter in which it was not particularly useful. It didn't really do anything. The main takeaway from the bag of tricks is just throw out a a fuzzball at the end of an encounter. Unfortunately, Kralin has fallen for one of the world's classic blunders. Only more famous is never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line. Slightly less famous is never use the line, I completely agree, against the person who also has the power of editing on it. <laughs> Any caveat you say after that is completely unnecessary. I sense another short. <laughs> Moving on to number five. This one was seven vampire spawn. Eight level spirit guardians. If there's anything to take away from this entire series after level five, it is cast spirit guardians. <laughs> Have a nice day. Spirit guardians go burr. <laughs> If you have Spirit Guardians and you don't cast it, you have wasted a turn. Uh, that's fifth level Dungeon Dragons. <laughs> that's accurate. Spirit Guardians on a cleric with 24 AC in particular go burr. I think you threw 12 attacks at me this session. Not a single one of them even got me to check my concentration. Oh yeah, I threw more than that. Incredibly powerful. The fact that you slow down all movement approaching you means I have to stand at the edge of it and then move in on my next turn, which kills one of my actions off. I want to mention some structural issues because I think that they came out the most in this one. We used three vampires, which were all the same vampire. And in this fight, we used seven vampire spawn. And this is because the game doesn't come equipped with much in the way of vampires. And especially at higher levels, the challenge of building a thematic dungeon at appropriate levels becomes basically throw single big monster or throw lots of little monsters. If vampire spawns, while thematically appropriate, we could tear through up seven vampire spawns any day of the week with this party. It's not going to be a challenge, and a lot of that is just area of effect damage gets so strong when you're dumping a level 8 spirit guardians. If there was some kind of intermediate vampire that you could stick 
two of them in a room and have this fight, Spirit Guardians would be a lot less good, but that's just not something that's offered in the official documentation. I assume vampires get a lot more interesting encounter-wise if you purchase Curse of Strahd. They don't, actually. Part of the problem here is that all of our enemies in this, vampires and archmages, these are primarily social campaign enemies. These are enemies that have strong roleplay elements, part of their power baked into, you know, non-combat based encounters. Curse of Strahd is a whole entire campaign built around a vampire as a social enemy. He's a narrative enemy and you fight him at the end. We're doing this as a strictly combat dungeon. All of these enemies have strengths that we're never going to see. And they've got power baked in in ways that we're never going to encounter. What abilities are theirs do they have that are not going to be effective in combat? Turning into mist. You can kill them and they can come back later. Those are social encounter powers. Those are things that, that create a narrative enemy that gives it strength, but is not meaningful in a one-off combat. Archmage in particular can stop time, put up a wall of force, and run away. Not an encounter that will happen in a one-off dungeon. Archmage is sort of the ideal lieutenant to a high-level enemy kind of character, because he's not himself a strongly characterized enemy, can converse with you, can set up traps, have interactions. He's a great narrative bad guy, but he was a little lackluster in a one-and-done combat where we're never going to see him again. Structurally, that's just part of how we're going at this, and what D&D core resources offer are a little limited for our approach. And it winds us up having lots of, like, big AoE solves this fights, like like this one the shape changer ability it can turn into a bat can't do unarmed strike and it can't do multi-attack in a bat form but it can bite and it can charm and it can summon other bats and rats and wolves it has all of its legendary actions it's fully a vampire in bat form it gives it a fly speed mist is completely broken it just doesn't work it allows it to pass through small gaps which is kind of the only thing that I would see about it. If it did work, that would be the reason I would want to use it. But it's an action to shapeshift, and those always suck. Misty Escape, I guess it's a narrative ability. Vampires are very, very equipped to flee combat. If a vampire turns into a bat, summons a bunch of ads for us to walk through while we try to catch it, and then flies away, that's very good narratively, but in a dungeon encounter is completely nonsensical. It's useless. It's even valuable in a dungeon encounter in the sense that the vampire can run away, regen, and come back, and we've expended resources, and it hasn't. But that's not how our dungeons are structured. Oh, that's the tactic I missed. No, 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 that absolutely would work in our dungeons. You're absolutely right. I missed that. Turn a bat, fly away, regen, come back, do an attack, fly out. That would work. I don't know that the action economy is there for them to do it, but... That would work in our format if I got more than one turn. And if him flying out, flying in didn't cause him to take 30 damage on average from Spirit Guardian. I'm thinking less in terms of a tactical use versus a strategic use in depleting resources than running away, regening back, and coming back in in a different encounter. Think of it as if our vampire in this dungeon were the same vampire every time. That's more practical to have him as a narrative enemy where it's that same vampire in three different fights that we finally cornered him in the last one but you know you can keep on doing that over and over but that doesn't change the challenge rating calculus yeah exactly that's what he's getting at there's things baked into the vampire that give it power outside of the structure of the engagement that we're in. It would make like a vampire an appropriate enemy for a 13th level party. I don't see that as true at all, but I see what you're saying, but it, I can't recall reading anything that says that challenge rating is calculated by the narrative place of a monster in a specific space. But it's certainly possible that's the case. In more narrative-focused campaigns, there's an optional rule to have a short rest be eight hours and long rest be a week. That that's probably the kind of thing that might have more bearing on the challenge rating calculation. One, we know that CR or challenge rating is a concept is flawed at best. Let's acknowledge that right there. I disagree. There's instructions in the Dungeon Master Guide about what challenge rating is based off of. There's a whole table of like, you just expect to have this many hit points, this many AC, this difficult of spell save DC, this to hit, this to damage on average around. Now, whether they've been accurately marked on that table right, like that's a different question. Whether they've read the table right when they wrote the number down is a different thing. There's also a different question about whether or not the player's ability matches up with that table. I'm not saying that that's necessarily true either. I'm not saying the table works properly. I'm not saying that the table has been applied properly. I'm saying that the structure 
structure is there for balance to exist, like challenge rating balance to exist at all. Do you think that's fair or are you rejecting that as well? Saracen, you're putting me on the spot. I'm going to defer to, to Kron. Challenge rating as a concept is an attempt at a simple solution to a problem that is more complex than it can handle. That it helps, but it is far from perfect. Not that anybody was expecting it to be perfect, but it runs into challenges when you get into higher levels. And a lot of those challenges happen to be burst damage and AOE and things like that. Working on raw numbers when it should be working on squares and cubes and things like that with how effective is an AOE in a particular fight. I really tried. I have no idea what you're saying. I actually get where Kron's going with this, right? So I will agree with Saracen when he says that CR is a tool, and if the tool were balanced properly, it would work. Kron is saying the tool can never be balanced properly because it's trying to answer a question that has way too many levers and knobs for a single tool to solve that the tool needs to solve. Giving a DM a reasonable framework for balance, giving the DM a reasonable framework for experience expected resource drain and interaction, all that. The delta between what the tool tells you this monster will provide and what it actually provides, it gets worse and worse and worse as the levels go up. Since I've already shot myself on the foot, I can say without fear that I completely agree. Another <laughs> aspect of that is player skill isn't something CR can account for, and yet it tries to. It tries to give an appropriately leveled challenge for a given level of character, but D&D implicitly wants the player to succeed. It would be a different question if structurally D&D doesn't care if you win or lose any given combat encounter, but it does. It implicitly wants the player to succeed, which means it needs to be built for a moderate to low-skilled player to succeed, and so a high-skilled player is going to succeed more easily and with fewer resource expenditures by virtue of being more efficient. By the time that you get to higher CRs, you've got players who understand their characters well and can act more efficiently. We're playing with a more intent and focus on playing efficiently than most players would necessarily be approaching these kinds of encounters. My little toss of the bag of tricks there was incredibly suboptimal. Unfortunately, CR has to account for that. If we're running with three players who are much better at optimal play than I am, CR still has to count for me. Yeah, I think you guys are attributing more to the calculation than is necessary, though I could be wrong about that. Fundamentally, there's a amount of damage that can be absorbed and amount of damage that can be dealt. As far as I know, that's the only calculus that goes into challenge rating. Whether that is properly applied across the monsters, that's a different question. I think you could actually empirically determine well, no, you have a bunch of monsters that don't actually do that. I don't understand what about a vampire is a challenge rating 13. I don't see it in this. The challenge rating in the book has certain caveats attached to it that cause its numbers to be inaccurate. And that's the subjectivity of the layman's D&D game. The final encounter was another vampire and a number of whites. Whites are CR3, small bag of hit points with a couple of missile weapons. An attempt was made to draw you into the fight. You guys blasted away with an AOE. This one was a little more run and hide, but still you guys hunted him down. I guess it's eighth level spirit guardians that I really don't have any way of managing. I can't get into that, and you guys can just bunker in it. That's the solution. Magic missile on the cleric. If there was any threat of magic missile, it would just be another globe of invulnerability. If you're dealing with a globe of invulnerability, it's immobile. Maybe you'd have to force the globe of invulnerability and then draw the cleric out so that you could try and pop the spirit guardians. It's a very, very challenging thing to deal with. You guys have so much range damage that there's actually no way of drawing you out of anything. Like, you're the only person who gets drawn out anyway, and you're like, fine, I got a cleric with two channel divinities in his back pocket, so if I drop, if you chew through 200 hit points of fighter, then you gotta chew through another, what are you at now, cleric? 75? 75 hit points of fighter. Then you gotta chew through another 75 hit points of fighter, and now you've dropped one person. 350 hit points of fighter with which is not going to happen. Speaking of which, I should probably get ignored in the future aids. My AC of 24 leads me to not care that much about additional hit points. Unless I'm crit, I'm not going to get hit by a lot of things that cause me to worry. Wizard, was it just a joke? Was it just for the lols? Why are you throwing maximized magic missiles? The lols. The DM can't do any damage to me. How much damage can I do to myself? Oh, like I was kidding when I said no damage speed run, but mostly the damage was self-inflicted at this point. Yeah, it was just the lols. 
I can't think of any damage that wasn't self-inflicted except to the Jackal. I do want to look at the numbers on that really quickly, though, because there is some value in the overchannels, but it's only on very high-level magic missiles. And at that point, you might as well just be casting something high-level that just does more damage, like... A Disintegrate or something. High-level Fireballs, high-level Sunburst. Even the early overchannels count when they don't hurt you very much. And the trade-off is like, oh, free overchannel for a maximized magic missile, or 2d12 overchannel for a maximized magic missile, they increase in impact, right? Every every time it goes up by one. You're just kicking yourself into the higher damage overchannels the earlier you use them. So you've got to think of your use of overchannel. Every single overchannel, in a sense, is kind of your last one. 100%. Even though you can tell yourself early on, like, oh, it's free overchannel, I'll use it on magic missile, whatever. That's what's setting you up to take 40 12 damage sunburst over channel later on when you really need it. There are some interesting choices on when to do over channel and when to just use it on your magic missile. Better tactic, don't do it. 100% better tactic is really don't do it on magic missile. Like I said, use it on something that's got bigger umps behind it. You do have a cleric who didn't need to use his channel divinities at all. Eh, it's fine. Maps. This is a scaled up map. I've zoomed in. These are at 200% 2x size. Grid is placed down to the regular size. Placement here. Like, dislike, complaint. Given how thoroughly we went into discussion of the tactics around this fight, I think that this placement was fine. It's just that the tactics needed to take advantage of it. Is this the sort of placement you want to see where you have the opportunity to back up further? Because that's been one of your complaints in the past. I do like this, and if it had been a different fight, when I saw this, I was like, oh, this is new, this is different. We could potentially use this. It didn't wind up being needful, but on a different fight, it could have been very interesting. It also expands the size of the corridor, so instead of being one across where one person can squeeze through, two people can squeeze through. So Yeah, 10 foot quarters is always a really good thing. Same thing here. Same thing here. This one is double sized, making more room for people to move around and do things in it. This one is double sized so that, again, 10 foot corridor, more room to move around. This would have been impossible for the larger people to move through. These were not, as you could probably see by the resolution. Other thoughts about the maps? They're very visually interesting. Thank you to Seafoot Games. They do fantastic work. Encounters were thematic? Yes. Yes, the encounters were thematic. Almost to their own detriment, they were thematic within the resources that you have in the Monster Manual. That's all for the encounter, storming the castle of a vampire count. Next week we'll continue with level 16 and stopping a runaway demon engine. Thank you for stopping by. I'm Saracen Zero, and I hope to see you then.